welcome back to another episode of Handloader TV. And in this episode, we're continuing on with our series on World War II small arms. And to help me out is my good friend, Mike Venturino. And he's also the author of Shooting World War II Small Arms. So we got a pretty neat little rifle here. M1 carbines have a special place in my heart. I wanted one since I was a little kid. And for my 16th birthday, my dad had joined the NRA and got one of the DCM ones that delivered cost you exactly $20. <laughs> and I was one happy 16 year old. Uh, it was my first centerfire rifle. Uh, almost all carbines you see nowadays have a fully adjustable rear sight here and they have a bayonet lug. Those were put in post World War II. Ah. When they're made in World War II, they'll have a flat bolt. You can see that's kind of flattish there. Right. They have just this sight, 100 yards, 300 yards, just like that. Uh, and they have no bayonet lug. So if you're watching a movie and they got a bayonet lug in a World War II in one carbine, you go, that's a mistake. Tell your wife or whatever, you know, she'll get really aggravated with you. Uh, this is a standard products one. And I bought oh. this in your town. In my town? In Prescott, Arizona. I let one slip through my fingers? Uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, when I saw this, nobody else got their hands on it until I went out the door. Uh, it's a standard products in one carbine. And they were one of the rarest made. I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was single digit. Wow. And and that's out of 6.25 million M1 carbines made. <laughs> I keep bringing, coming back to the manufacturing ability of America at those days. It was something to really gawk at, to be impressed with. Yeah. They invented this. This was accepted for production by the U.S. Army. Winchester made the prototype. They didn't want to, but they were asked under the table by the Ordnance Department to submit a prototype for testing, and they won. Hmm. And they become the M1 carbine. That was in September of 1941. Wow. They went into production in December of 1941. And by August of 1945, when they quit production, all production, 6.25 million have been made. Wow. Now think about that. They, the only company of the 10 manufacturers who produced M1 carbines, the only one who had made rifles or any firearms previously was Winchester. And they gave contracts to nine other companies who had never made a rifle in their life, in their, in their business life. And they all started producing carbines. Inland, one of the in the manufacturers of automotive stuff in Michigan, they made the most. Winchester oh. made the second most. This one is a standard products. When I happened on it in that gun store in Prescott, Arizona, I looked at it and I said, hmm, World War II sight. Hmm. No bayonet lug. Hmm. Standard products. And I just kind of went. <laughs> Nobody's getting this gun. <laughs> Didn't let that one get away. No way. That so, is really neat. And uh, they're amazing. The amount, I mean, going back to that manufacturing, it's amazing the amount of rifles they were able to turn out. Well, what's even more amazing is they had 10 manufacturers making parts, and they traded parts back and forth just to get guns out the door. But you could take an M1 carbine made by Winchester and an M1 carbine made by Standard Products, Take all the parts apart, jumble them up, put it back together, and it'll work. Wow. 100% so. interchangeability of parts. Yeah. This one is new enough to me. I haven't even gotten the sling and oiler in it yet, but I have shot it. It's a good shooting rifle. I haven't even, I can't say for sure I've sighted it in. I've shot it and I hit what I was shooting at, so I didn't worry about it too much. <laughs> so Good enough, right? We'll take this one down and... Uh, in one of the other episodes, I said my favorite loads for the M1 carbine. I'll repeat it. I have a bullet mold from Seiko, Redding Seiko, three cavity mold. I cast those. They weigh about 115 grains out of the line of type. Put gas checks on them. Load them over 17 grains of 5744, which now belongs to Hodgson. Mm -hmm. That's a good cast bullet load. Or for 
military duplication loads, I'll take any 110 grain round nose and load it over 14.5 grains of hydrogen 110. Okay. And that duplicates mil military ballistics. Very nice. Well. So, got a soft spot for these. I've owned a dozen of them over the years. And uh, this is this one and my Winchester one are the favorites. Really? Mm -hmm. They are really neat rifles. I mean, I, I have an appreciation for them too. I mean, they weren't my very first rifle. That one's always very special in your heart, you know, but mm -hmm. they, they were early on introduced to me and I really liked them. And then getting to shoot your M2 carbine at one of our wolf shoots, that kind of like... That'll hook you. <laughs> oh, it, it got me hooked big time. Big time. Yes. Well, they came with 15-round magazines. Later, they developed, after World War II, or at the end of World War II, they developed banana magazines, they call them, curved 30-round magazines. I've never had a 30-round magazine that functioned well, so I don't worry about them. Right. And trigger pulls aren't great. Finish isn't great. It was a wartime expedient manufacturer, but they did a great job on them. They did. They did. On a, on a little side note, and you got me thinking, you know, I, my grandpa was in the, in the United States Army, and I remember him talking. He carried an M1 carbine, and he said, you know, if it wasn't windy, you could shoot them out to 300 yards. They'd mm -hmm. do it, and you could you could actually get hits on a man-sized target it, with some practice, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know. But it, it was very interesting, and he really liked it because they were so lightweight, easy to carry, so... Well, they handed these things out like popcorn when they got some money of them. Uh, I've read instances of troops in the Pacific especially because the Japanese were famous for infiltrating into foxholes, you know, mm -hmm. anywhere they could come in and cause trouble during the night they would. And the Marines said, it was a, your M1 Garand was a great rifle to go fight with. They said, M1 carbine in the foxhole with you with a 15-round magazine was just plain comfort. Right. Oh, I can see that mm -hmm. for sure. Well, what do you say we take this rifle out and we'll go hit the range? Like I said, I haven't shot it very much. We'll find out what it does. Sounds good to me. You bet. So now we got the M1 carbine benched in and the target's at 100 yards. So what do you say, Mike? Shall we stretch the carbine's legs and see if we can hit? Sounds good to me. Mike's spotting for me as usual. So let's see what we can do. Center. Well, Keep those shooting. Sights are right on. A little high, a little right. Still good. Okay, another high, right. Still good. Okay. That made the third mark bigger. <laughs> okay, you've got a four shot group of about two inches after the first shot. One not, more. Not bad, not bad at all. That made the first shot bigger, that's a great five shot group Jeremiah well, you gonna... should have two more rounds in there I want you to take aim and shoot those two as fast as you can okay I can do that you you tell me when to go how's that go both were hit <laughs> wow for this and that's is just... why the Just Marines like to have one of those in the foxhole at night on the Iwo Jima. I can certainly see why. It is a dandy little carbine. I mean, just a dandy carbine. Real handy, really light. It sure beats packing around an M1 Grand all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like them too. And 100 yards, that impressed me. And the sights were right on. And 
just a smooth shooter. So we're back from the range now after shooting all the various different carbines and we've got a few of our favorites here and we figured we'd talk about them all at once. That way we can uh, kind of compare and contrast the differences between the two, the ones that performed really well. And so first up, I have to say my favorite right off the bat, I'm going to jump the gun on you here, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. M1 carbine. I not only agree with you, I'm pretty happy. I have had this carbine a couple of years and hardly fired it. I shot it at 25 yards at steel uh, one time. Uh -huh. And so we took it out there today at 100 yards. It was just fine. It shot dead center, a little high on the steel plate, it shot a nice round group. Uh, what I'm also happy about is that is a standard products M1 carbine. And if my memory is correct, don't quote me. I think they only made 4% of M1 carbine production. So it's a rare carbine and it's an excellent shooting carbine. I so, would agree in full with that. You, and it's light and it's handy. Yep. You being here got me to get this out and use it and I appreciate that. Well, I'm, I'm glad you were willing to share it with me and share the ammo because that was really, really cool to see just how capable these carbines are. Yeah. Now, the, I think you have a comment about the British carbine. I'll let you say that first. I shot that thing. I don't mind the Enfield action here. I mean, it's not a bad action. Whoever's bright idea it was to put this little, I don't even know what you'd call that, a torture device, Mike? Tor torture device, for sure. Boy, you want it, it feels like it doubles the recoil over a standard stock. I mean, that is a horrible idea. Well, what they did was take a nice wide butt plate that distributes recoil and then put a narrower piece on it so it would hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it feels like, too. It just, it hits you. And I'll, I'm, I'm sore. My shoulder's sore from all the shooting and everything, but this one, it that's, downright hurt. That's why I didn't shoot this one. Uh, that's a smart, <laughs> smart move. Here you shoot it. No, but no. actually, it didn't shoot too terrible, and I probably would have shot better had it not been for that. I mean, yeah. I know I was kind of anticipating the recoil a little bit on that. It's got a lot of good points. It's it's got a ten round magazine. It's got a flip up sight with good uh, adjustments. Uh, the only thing wrong with it is that butt plate. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So then we also talked, well, shot this Mauser here. And this is a really cool Mauser. And we'll have separate videos detailing all of these. Be sure to watch for those as they're released. But this Mauser did really well, I thought. That's a G33-40 that the Czechoslovakians made under German rule. And the Germans' main reason for having them was mountain troops and see how they reinforced the butt for knowing men were going to use those to walk across ice fields and such right. to protect the butts. The action on this is unbelievably smooth. I, I've seen very few sporting rifles and very expensive sporting rifles that were the actions were as nice as that. I can attest to that. It was, it was smooth as butter. I mean, it felt really nice. And if I recall, we only got a three-shot group with this because <laughs> we had some technical difficulties and we killed the, the steel plate at 100 yards. And not me, we, you. I'm trying to pass the blame <laughs> off, but he's not going to let me uh, forget that. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful thing. He hit that target and it just went boom. And you'll hear us all laugh. It, be sure to watch a video on that one that because, one. oh, it, it was a lot of fun to shoot. My only complaint about this rifle is the rear sight, the open rear sight, it's close to the front sight. I think if the Germans had been more involved in, say, target shooting a little bit, they would have put a rear sight back here, uh, peep sight. But that was something, you know, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's kind of something to go back to the British and the other carbines we've shot and talked about and have separate videos on, is the British one has a nice long sight radius, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But that was kind of, if I recall, the Mosin had a real short sight radius as well. Yes. 
Right. Well, Japanese also. And the Japanese also. And well, interestingly, we got pretty poor performance out of both of those, if I recall. Both. We shot a uh, Moisson model 38. We shot a Japanese type 44. Neither one shot very well. Not no. at all. Mm -mm. And the sights weren't too bad. It, I think the shorter sight radius probably had something mm -hmm. to do with that. And then the, the Mosin trigger and, and the Japanese trigger wasn't all that good either. But right. They're both a lot of fun to shoot and very interesting to get to compare and contrast and kind of see the weapons that were used around the world. Uh, I'd like to wrap up by saying I've read that on some of the Pacific Islands, the Japanese love to infiltrate at night and Marines love to have an M1 carbine in the foxhole with them because they had 15 rounds before they had to load it again. Yeah, I can, I can believe that. Out of all of them, I think that's a clear winner. Of the carbines, yeah, of the carbines, most definitely. And we only scratched the surface with information on each of these rifles. They're, again, we'll have videos on them, but if you really want to learn more about these rifles, and you need to check out Mike Venturino's book, Shooting World War II Small Arms. He's got his loads in there for these rifles, which we shot a lot of. Mm -hmm. He's got all kinds of numbers and manufacturing and when and where and all kinds of information so be sure to check that out it goes a lot more in depth than we can do in these videos and lastly i'd like to thank you for opening up your vault here and showing us these firearms and talking with me about them i'd i'd like to thank you for bringing your enthusiasm to my house uh, anytime i i i had so much fun and i hope you guys can see that in the video this was just it was two guys getting together, talking about rifles they love, and I'm learning all about them. And it, it was just so much fun. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate it. I also need to thank Ted Tompkins, our official gopher. Mm -hmm. He was running around like crazy, painting targets, getting us food, whatever we needed, ammunition. He kept us shooting, and I really appreciate that. So special thanks to Ted. And Chris Downs, he's the videographer and photographer. He's behind the scenes. You don't get to see him. But he does all the awesome camera angles, and he's filming us now as we speak. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, a special thanks to Don Polachek, the owner of Wolf Publishing, who made this trip and everything here all possible. So I thank Don, too. He's been a good boss to me. Me, too. <laughs> and he don't pay me to say that. <laughs> so with that said, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up and let us know. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when we post our next video. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to leave them in the comments section below. I do my best to answer every one of those. And I will see you guys in the next episode. Mm -hmm.